Stuck in no man's land, thousands of Rohingya try to escape, fighting in Myanmar by crossing into neighboring Bangladesh. But Bangladesh doesn't want them. A former UN chief has demanded an end to years of persecution of the Rohingya people. But who's listening? The violence just gets worse. This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Hashem Ahalbara. It's a humanitarian crisis that's growing all the time. Caught in a cycle of violence, tens of thousands of Rohingya are fleeing to Bangladesh from neighboring Myanmar. But they're not welcome, and security at the border is being tightened, leaving many of the refugees with nowhere to go. Florence Louis has more. This is the plight of thousands of Rohingya, fearful of remaining in Myanmar, yet not allowed into Bangladesh. They're stranded in no man's land. Mohammad Faisal has been here since last Saturday, a day after fighting broke out between rebel Rohingya fighters and the Myanmar military. The Rakhine beat us. If we go back to Myanmar, they will kill us and slice us into pieces. That's why we are here. Myanmar security forces are retaliating against attacks launched by a rebel Rohingya group that calls itself the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army. Rohingya villagers say they're being targeted. Those who've made it to Bangladesh bring with them stories of abuse. In my village, people were killed, houses were set on fire, and one of my relatives died. My own house was touched. I walked for three days before I made it here. But Bangladesh is feeling the strain from taking in so many refugees and is reluctant to take in more. Its border is officially closed. The Myanmar government's actions are forcing their people to come to our country. Then this becomes our problem. Our population increases, but our space is limited. The international community needs to act. The UN and other countries have called on the Myanmar government to exercise restraint when carrying out its military operations. The government has so far denied allegations of abuse, saying its security forces are cracking down on what it considers a terrorist organization. Thousands of Rakhine Buddhists, too, have been caught up in the fighting and are sheltering in Sitwe, the state capital. It's the worst violence in northwest Myanmar in at least five years. But it's mostly the Rohingya who are bearing the brunt of it. With no solution in sight, many prefer to take their chances on a dangerous journey than remain in Myanmar. A journey not everyone survives. Florence Louis, Al Jazeera. Last week, a report was released by a commission led by former UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. It made a series of recommendations aimed at ending the conflict, which Aung San Suu Kyi's government has previously said it would abide by. But in the days that followed, all we have seen is an increase in violence. Let's remind you of some of the key points from the commission's report address the Rohingya grievances or face the possibility of further radicalization. The biggest obstacle to peace is Myanmar's citizenship. All restrictions on Rohingya should be lifted. The commission saying they are the biggest single stateless community in the world. And it called for an independent investigation into alleged atrocities. We have lots to talk about. Let's bring in our panel. Phil Robertson is the Deputy Director for Asia of Human Rights Watch and joins me from Bangkok. Via Skype from Mysot in Thailand is Kim Jolliffe, an independent consultant working with various development and humanitarian organizations in Myanmar. And from London, Tung Kin, President of the Burmese Rohingya Organization in the UK, Welcome to you all. Let me first start by asking Mr. Phil Robertson this. Each time we revisit the Rohingya issue in this particular program, we're talking about when is this going to come to an end? It doesn't seem to be the case. What has prompted the latest cycle of violence? Well, the latest cycle of violence really started on, uh, on the Friday, the 25th of August, when we had attacks by the Arakan Rohingya Salvation Army against a number of police posts and an army base. Uh, that then, of course, prompted a reaction from the Burmese state, particularly the Burmese military, 
Uh, and what we're now seeing is the, the Burma army in the field uh, employing its standard uh, scorched earth tactics, attacking uh, not only insurgents, but obviously uh, entire communities and uh, driving them out of the country. Uh, this is a situation where uh, we expect there are going to be serious human rights violations found. We're, you know, in the field with many other people, interviewing people as they're coming across the border into Bangladesh. And already we have identified uh, 17 specific areas where there are uh, uh, fires taking place, arson happening. And we think that that is probably an underestimate. There are probably many, many more places mm -hmm. that is happening. So the latest is that a uh, massive number of refugees are leaving the country and they have stories to tell, and we're going to find out exactly what is happening mm. on the ground. In uh, about the stories to tell, let me go to Tun Kin. Tun, you must be in touch with your fellow Rohingya uh, in Myanmar or those who have been now forced out of the country. What are they telling you about the situation right now? Uh, they are telling very horrific situation. What they've been facing has been six days now, and the, uh, some of my relatives and friends have been telling me, they have seen children being thrown to the fire, and um, men, women, and children, they are burning alive, and also slaughtering even elderly men and women and children. This has been going on, and such a mass killings going on in our history, the witnessing uh, we are. We, uh, as, as a Rohingya, I have never seen this such large scale of um, mass killings against Rohingya. Anyhow, we've been facing this many decades, but this is the largest scale of killings against Rohingya. Mm -hmm. Unbelievable, incredible. Um, it's, uh, it shouldn't be this time, 21st century, what we've been facing in our country kind of right now. The wall is still, the wall leaders are not responding and the wall leaders are not talk and uh, not condemning what atrocity Speaking of the international time. reaction, let me uh, uh, go to um, Mr. Jolliffe. Mr. Jolliffe, the Rohingya ha have been described by the UN as the most friendless community in the world, the most persecuted community in the world. Why isn't the international community uh, able to come up with a firm reaction? Yeah, well, like, like so many of the human rights issues um, in Myanmar, there's just been this long-standing kind of debate and stagnation between parties of the international community that favor a kind of engagement approach and those that favor an isolation and sanctions approach. And the sanctions approach was kind of pursued for years, um, but predominantly the, the former regimes have been protected by China and the UN Security Council, as well as Russia at times. Um, and that kind of has led slowly to increased engagement from the West. Also, the fact that Myanmar has become a more strategically important country to the West in recent years because of the rise of China um, and other dynamics in the region. Um, the kind of whole isolation and sanctions approach was, was shelved by most of the Western aspects of the international uh, dimension of the international community. Um, and so there's been this engagement strategy since. And, that sort of achieved a lot in a number of domains, um, but in another way, it's kind of enabled uh, the military to continue uh, the ca engaging in counterinsurgency, targeting communities en masse in ways that it has done for decades, and in mm -hmm. particular, these unbelievably bad crimes against the Rohingya in particular. But, but then, set aside the international or the domestic implications, Mr. Robertson, you have someone like the state councillor, Aung San Suu Kyi, who has fought all her life for democratic uh, reforms in her own country, but remains really tight-lipped about this whole episode. What's wrong? I mean, I think the problem right now is that the government of Myanmar uh, is not interested in accountability. Uh, the issue of the uh, international community and their involvement in this situation, there is a mechanism. It is called the fact-finding mission. This was appointed by the UN Human Rights Council uh, in a resolution in March in Geneva. That committee has been constituted. It is going to be seeking to come into Burma to s investigate these kind of abuses. And the government of Burma is saying that they're not going to cooperate with it. They're not going to be giving visas to those commissioners and to the staff to be able to come into the country. You know, 
Burma is going back to the bad old days. It is going back to a time when Burma was a human rights pariah. You know, if you look at the number of countries that, the, how, that refuse to cooperate with the Human Rights Council, you list them, you know, it's like Syria, Burundi, North Korea, Ethiopia, Eritrea. I mean, these are the bad actors when we look at human rights issues around the world. And for Burma, so soon after the election of Aung San Suu Kyi in November uh, uh, last year was, uh, I mean, is, is now, what are, we, what are we looking at? We're looking at a situation where, uh, for some reason, you know, the situation on human rights is going backwards when everybody expected at this point it would be going forward. Mm -hmm. Mr. Kin, there was this report by the United Nations Commission led by former Secretary General Kofi Annan saying that the st status quo cannot continue in Burma. Do you think that the recommendations that were put forth by the Commission could or might be implemented any time soon in the future? When we talk Kofi Annan Commission, we need to point out here the political willingness in Burma. You know, we, can't, we have not seen any political will from military, from NLD, and Rakhine parties and others. That is the problem we have seen. The Rohingyas are quite unwanted, and the policy military uh, long-term plan is to wipe out the, the whole minority. So, and also we have to see in this point, when Kofi Annan Commission uh, released report, military objected on that. There are some points, you know, uh, still we have to consider, and they are not agree. It looks like uh, you have to see that military is not agree. You have to see that the center of uh, the center of control in Burma is uh, still me online. We should look at quite more, you know, military commander in chief who is playing the game. So, um, of course, NLD Dao Sen Suchi, she is denying everything. She is siding with the military, but the control is uh, still under of military. And same time, uh, here. I, uh, for me, yes, for Kofi Annan Commission report is for long-lasting, sol uh, for permanent mm -hmm. solution. For the longer term, we have to look at this commission report. But now, as a Rohingya myself, I want, uh, uh, what I want to uh, urge here, what I want to appeal the world here is we, these killings must stop by Burmese army. I see so your point. Mm -hmm. uh, military in uh, commander in chief, me online is the only person. Okay. Uh, you know, well, we must uh, pressure immediately to stop that. And international community, right. like, uh, you know, EU and others, they have to stop so military. So you're basically saying that all the international bodies should up with intervene to put more pressure on the government. Mr. Um, yeah, exactly, exactly. No, same time, mm -hmm. we have to come up with pressure to stop financial and other engagement, military training. Some countries are uh, uh, practicing with them. That should stop, and also financial, and they have to okay. also put some sanction list of military commanders who okay. are uh, currently leading. So this is the point, because if the, the soft approach, they continue, the impunity, they will go ahead. So hmm. there is only one choice, whether they want to, uh, they want to go for stronger approach, uh, or whether the okay, you're talking the about a stronger approach to put an end to the sufferings of the Rohingya. Mr. Uh, Jolliffe, who's to blame? Is it the state councillor? Is it the military establishment or a predominantly Buddhist society that does not seem to be uh, tolerant towards the other ethnic minorities? Well, it's certainly primarily the military, um, both the military that's in pa that still holds a lot of sway now and is able to conduct these operations completely autonomously, um, but also a long, long culture of the state becoming increasingly militarized um, and particularly sort of uh, engaged around this narrative of there being a select group of nationalities which form the Myanmar body um, and other groups who fall outside that being a threat. Uh, and that's been an institutional culture that has been developed over 50 years, is deeply ingrained, uh, and that military still controls not just does it have autonomy in the defense and security sector, uh, but it also controls much mm -hmm. of the economy and has huge political sway. Mm -hmm. um, but nonetheless, that has, that has developed a much broader political culture and to some extent a broader societal trend of this real fear of what are considered outsiders um, mm -hmm. and some really problematic notions about particularly forces coming from the West um, and particularly this kind of mythological idea of Myanmar being a frontier defending itself from the tides of Islam coming from the West for, for many years. Um, so all of these narratives have built up over a long period of time, 
And there's a lot of different factors now. Mm -hmm. But for sure, the military holds the responsibility both for the violence on the ground and for taking a more um, a much more humane and dignified approach mm -hmm. to fixing this whole mess. Let's play you this clip from Al Jazeera World, which recently put together a documentary on the Rohingya. This is an edited interview from a conservative Buddhist monk in Myanmar. As a Buddhist, I feel sorry for them. I have love and sympathy for them. But these Muslims living in Myanmar, we can't simply look at their human rights. They're not qualified to be citizens under our citizenship law. We have to follow the law. If we let them out, terrorist attacks will increase in Myanmar. Mr. Robertson, we've seen many ultra-nationalist uh, monks stirring anti-Rohingya, anti-Muslim uh, rhetoric over the last few mo months. How do you explain this? How do you explain it? Is it the society itself which doesn't seem to be sympathetic towards the grievances and the sufferings of the ethnic minorities? Well, it's a very dangerous trend and it's, it, it's intensifying. What we're seeing is uh, people like Wiratu uh, and other ultra-nationalists uh, really uh, turning up the heat on the Burma government to try to uh, get them to take action not only against the, the Rohingya but also against Muslim communities in other parts of the country to restrict freedom of religion, to restrict uh, these communities' abilities to, uh, uh, you know, operate and worship as they wish. Um, it, it's extremely dangerous, and it, and it, and it goes against the, the, the long history of Burma, which traditionally was much more of a uh, religiously permissive and open place where uh, different religions were able to operate, you know, and coexist. Wida, to Let's be clear about this. He is uh, a purveyor of hate speech. He is an instigator of violence. This person is doing things that is ultimately going to tear Burma apart unless the government intervenes. Mm -hmm. um, but the government continues to a either look the other way or ignore him. I mean, in some ways, you know, uh, Wira Tu is to Aung San Suu Kyi like Charlottesville is to uh, Donald Trump. You know, this is the extremist threat mm -hmm. that threatens to tear apart the fabric of society, and unless actions are taken to uh, bring this under control, to uh, essentially make uh, this situation one where, you know, coexistence is the, the watchword, not hatred, uh, Burma is going to have a very, very okay. difficult future. With this in atmosphere of uh, impunity in, in, in Myanmar and lack of firm response from the international community, Mr. Kin. Is there any concern that Rohingyas themselves, seeing their loved ones killed, their villages destroyed, might be radicalized in the near future, taking up arms against the establishment? As far as what we know, we uh, Rohingya reject the violence and Rohingya being peace-loving people. The Ro Rohingyas are the only group who are not uh, active armed groups for many years. You know, in like other ethnic groups, you know, Kashin, Karen, and others, they've been fighting with Burmese military for many years. We Rohingyas are the only group advocating for their rights uh, through advocacy, for the rights of our people. So it's a hard to say, but the situation become much, much worse. You know, people become vulnerable. They've been locked up, the people. They've been rounded up, and they are not even allowing to get food and medical treatment and such a human rights violation. Many decades, uh, according to legal assaults, what's happening to Rohingyas are genocide. So we are facing the last stage of genocide. And I, uh, it's, people are quite vulnerable. Mm -hmm. um, it may happen anytime, anything. We never know because people are quite desperate. People are quite desperate. Mm -hmm. As the International Crisis Group have, uh, have mentioned the report, this what happened last 25th of August, it was uh, preventable. It was actually predicted. So mm -hmm. the Burmese government let it happen and Burmese government uh, pushing towards that way. So this is going to be a big, much, much more difficult situation mm -hmm. for everyone. So, so the thing is the role of international community here. What the international community? There is 25 years human rights general assembly council resolution and human rights council. Resolution. Speaking of the Call role for, that the international uh, community, uh, stop, uh, yeah, persecution, uh, yeah, persecution, uh, stop persecution mm -hmm. of the Rohingya. But 
no one did any action, unfortunately. Okay. Speaking of that particular to act, uh, uh, angle, community. Mm -hmm. so Mr. Jolly, I want to point out here. Yeah, yeah. That Very briefly, please. The important point here is the world must act now. The world leaders should act now immediately. Okay. That is what I about this in particular, and let me go to Mr. Jolly. Do you think that a visit by the Pope, which is scheduled for November, could be an opportunity to raise international awareness about the need to put an end to the sufferings uh, of the Rohingya? Yeah, I think there's definitely um, there's there's definitely some some positive things that can come out of out of the visit, um, but I think still the the solutions really lie within the country, um, and both the kind of approaches of engagement by the international community and trying to present carrots, as well as the former approach of trying to pressure externally through kind of sticks of isolation and sanctions, neither have had a huge impact. Um, and the the tough reality is this is going to be a slow burn process um, where a lot needs to be done within the country to to rebuild um, to, to rebuild relations mm -hmm. and, and sort of develop an entire new this idea of cohabitation that Phil mentioned is the kind of message which a good a strong leader in the country should be giving at the very least mm -hmm. um, to argue that you know we are not the kind of country that allows this kind of thing to happen and to be part of the international community we need a much more rational approach to these issues at the very least. Mr. Robert, um, and that needs to come from within inside the country. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason why I also uh, put in some emphasis on the role of the international community, and let me go to Mr. Robertson, is the fact that rights activists are basically saying that the mass murders, the mass gang rapes, the destruction of villages are acts that amount to crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing. Yet the international community is not implementing sanctions. Why? Well. What has happened here uh, is both in the period of violence from last October uh, in 2016 to March 2017 this year and this current round of violence, uh, the Burmese military and the government have basically kept outsiders away from this situation. They've, uh, pan they've kept the UN humanitarians and international NGOs out. They've kept the media out. They've kept organizations like us out. You know, they're trying to uh, hide what is happening in this remote area, uh, you know, keep it obscure, not define what it is. Uh, what is clear is that in 2012, when there was violence all over Rakhine State, both in June and in October 2012, we were on the ground. We were able to mm -hmm. make an assessment that, in fact, crimes against humanity and ethnic cleansing had occurred. And this last round of violence in, from October to March, the U.N. found that. I expect, again, that it, we will probably find that kind of in, uh, situation if we're permitted to go into this area. So mm -hmm. now what is happening is the government is trying to keep these people out. They're trying to, they're trying to keep out uh, the, the fact-finding mission. Mm -hmm. and the international community has to get behind the UN and say, look, this is what we proposed, this is what we agreed, this is what needs to happen. And we need to move towards accountability. Exactly. We need to remove these radical kinds from the situation and ultimately we need to get to a point where mm -hmm. the the Burma army knows that if they do these things in the field if they pursue these scorched earth tactics they will be held accountable I see your point this is going to and be my last mm -hmm. this is and going to be my last question to Mr. That. to Mr. Kin Mr. Kin very briefly please your own people are driven out from their own villages, shunned by neighboring countries like Bangladesh. They don't enjoy full citizenship rights. They're killed. They're considered social pariahs in their own country. How do you see the future? Future is, uh, is uh, quite blind, quite blind. It depends on how international community will act. The point is, we have seen many years uh, you know international community been raising but there is no effective action you know what we've been facing now is massive displacement and mass killings and burning all the rohingya villages so this will be a big big difficult time for the rohingyas and horrific situation what we are facing and the protection here i think is a uh, protecting the Rohingya lies on international community. So it is time for international community have uh, a responsibility to mm -hmm. act, a responsibility to protect the Ro Rohingyas. Otherwise, if they let it happen, this Rohingya 
1.3 million Rohingya will be wiped out. The way the Burmese government is moving forward, international community is failing to act. Still, we have not seen any strong uh, condemnation from world leaders, and uh, internet world leaders have to talk mm -hmm. with uh, our Dong San Suu Kyi and Commander in Chief Thank Miao Lai. Thanks to all our guests, Phil Robertson. Kim Jolliffe and Tun Kin. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. From me, Hashim Ahlbala, and the whole team here. Bye for now.